is uh, basically added into the one, two, three, four, five kind. So one is called conventional techniques. Second is advanced techniques. Third is quantitative techniques. Fourth is high throughput techniques. Fifth is bioinformatic analysis. So then conventional technique, what we are doing usually chromatographic based techniques like iron exchange chromatography, size exclusion chromatography, affinity chromatography. These are the chromatographic techniques in the conventional techniques. Second in, in jam lead, immunosorbent testing, Elijah. Third is Western blotting. So all these things are conventional techniques. Now the advanced techniques. Advanced techniques has one protein microarrays, like analytical protein microarrays, functional protein microarrays, reverse phase protein microarrays. All these microarrays are exist and people are using for the protein microarrays. Then also these days, even this is more common, uh, like a mass spectrometry. So like gel-based approaches, in that gel-based approach, like uh, enhanced SDS based. 2D page, 2D dyes, also coming in the advanced techniques. Then mass spectrometry. And mass spectrometry itself is a huge, uh, you can say, uh, stuff like uh, mass spectrometry uh, at the seven or eight point. So liquid and then gas and then many other kinds. So these are the mass spectrometry techniques. And these days, I can say that most of the advancement is coming in the mass spectrometry techniques. So it is very robust, useful, and very progressive. So, and then uh, Edmond sequencing is also came out. Uh, we can say NGS, what kind, uh, at the protomic level also what we can do. Then quantitative techniques. In the quantitative techniques is ICAT, celiac, ITRAC, that can be done in the quantitative technique. And then uh, high throughput technique, X-ray crystallography, NMR spectroscopy, that can also be done. Uh, a lot of uh, samples can be done in one time. And then bioinformatic analysis, that always one can do it. Is the slide visible? Hello? This slide? Yes, sir. So, as uh, same as the uh, DNA microarray, protein microarray is also somewhat similar, where you have uh, like pooled internal standard label with size 2, protein extract label with size 3, protein extract label with size 5. So here we have internal controls also, and then two different kind of samples. So label protein extract with size dye, dyes, uh, flow minimal dyes, and then mix these extract and do the 2D separation. I think uh, many of you, when you type it, in the Google also, you will see the 2D jails. So then you can see these kind of jails. And further, then you do the image jail with side eye a specific a scanner. Then you are using side two, side three, side five eye uh, to scan these spots. And then you do the image analysis and data quantitation using appropriate software. And then you can have this kind of peaks, like this peak size is this much, this peak size is this much. So basically, based on the peak intensity, <laughs> So oh, based on the peak diameter, you can identify your sizes. Now, protein analysis can be many steps. Like first is purification. So protein purification can be done by the chromatography-based techniques. Protein analysis can be done by the ELIJA, Western blotting, protein microarrays. Protein characterization can be done by gel based approaches, mass spectrometry. And then sequence analysis by the Edamon sequencing, quantitation, the ICAT, celiac, and ITRAC. And structural analysis can be X ray, crystallography, NMR spectroscopy. And further, one can understand the bioinformatic analysis. Now, one of the example how uh, one can do the experiments. So in this case, like if you have total set proteins, right? That can be many samples, more than two or two. And then you have, hello, in just in the last slide, what we have seen that uh, in by mixing with the two different uh, or three different one internal control and two experimental control, uh, we can 
uh, put on the either membrane and then we can have this kind of pattern. So basically this is total protein profile. Uh, this called two dimensional electrophoresis or if we are using the dye, then it is called two, uh, two D dye also. But then here there are some variation. We can validate these experiments through various other ways also. Like we can vary it by the like we we can have here different different uh, uh, ex experimental detail like uh, in the group one uh, some proteins are very highly expressed. In group two some proteins are down regulated. Then we have to validate it. So how we will validate it through the pull down assays. So in the pull down assays we are here targeting those specific uh, proteins. Because see, when we are doing any high throughput uh, stuff, either it is the microarray or the major sequencing or protein or something like that, although they are specific, but then there are chances always that they may have some kind of, uh, uh, you can say the some kind of non-specific stuff also. So uh, a scientific community or any good uh, journals, they don't uh, uh, accept work without the proper validation. So if you do any uh, high throughput uh, it is on DNA level, protein level, RNA level, you have to again see that on the specific individual level also. Or like we are having 2D dyes and then we can see okay here 30 proteins are very highly regulated and 50 proteins are very down regulated. But then we have to see at individual level also that, that really it is happening in that good conditions or not. But then why then we are doing it? High throughput things because if we do this pull down assay or affinity chromatography for the 500 proteins or 1000 proteins, it is not possible. It may take like years and years and too much time. So, to minimize those time, those 1000 protein or those 500 protein or those 2000 proteins, we can do in one, one time. And out of that, those best 10, 5, 2, or 20, we can have it and that we can do one by one in this one so that's why these uh, high throughput techniques are important and uh, it, it, it is uh, useful so again those high throughput uh, uh, experiments can be validated through the pull down assay like where we can do even protein structure modeling to the extra cryptography and nmr also and immunoprecipitation like uh, gst pull down ivt in vitro translation as well as the immunoprecipitation and chromoprecipitation also second thing is affinity chromatography one can do the uh, this Marley-Toff and mass spectrometry for the peptide identification and then map protein-protein that one can do. If you go and see various protein-protein interaction and various protein analysis plus data, you can find these kind of uh, uh, biological networks. So that is coming out uh, from these uh, experiments. Now, if, if it is going in, uh, so these techniques I am not going to cover. I can and uh, Mm, these ones you can simply type and you can see the videos also okay mm, just will give to the uh, differences so it will be so one is icat uh, so just giving one uh, definition it is okay fine okay so what is icat these are the quantitative technique this is so in vitro, in vitro where we call in vitro when we are working on the cell cultures, cell lines. So in in vitro labeling technique that modified peptide or protein is specifically at the 16 amino acid residue and can be used for accurate quantitation of protein expression. But then this is only for what? When we have the 16 amino acid residue. Okay, so this is the limitation of that. And after interacting with its labeling object, the learner will be able to do what? We can do define cell culture process. We can carry out isotap tagging to peptide. We can do infer peptide enrichment by affinity column. We can do perform LCMS, MS data, and spectrum analysis. We can do access the troubleshooting steps involving the experiments. So all these things is possible in this ICAT experiments. Uh, the procedure it is can be found in the internet also you don't have to worry about it but then it is one of the sophisticated and uh, quantitative experiments now the second is CLAC. what is the full form of CLAC? a stable isotope labeling with amino acids in cell cultures 
because you know in the cell culture uh, the generation of which cells are growing fast cells growing less uh, cells are doing this kind of treatment it is very tough if we, we are not label it in kind of metabolomics or proteomics or something like that but when you label it some part of the protein and when those part of the protein basically is expressing everywhere basically this is again housekeeping stuff because you know that gap death is coming in this cells accurately so you have as a uh, housekeeping uh, as a uh, so similarly, we are labeling it something that is possibly more abundant and everywhere it is. So the ability to enumerate all of the proteins in a cell is quickly becoming a reality. So quantitatively, proteomics add an extra dimension to proteome-wide discovery experiments by enabling differential measurement of protein concentrations, characterization of protein turnover, increasing increase astringency of co precipitation reactions as well as many other interviewing applications so one of the most widely used technique that enable relative here relative what came out why because we are doing the labeling stuff and it is same as the real-time pcr we are having the uh, um, housekeeping gene microarray we are having the again uh, some of the internal control in the 2D electrophoresis, we have the internal control. So here again, you see, that's why the labeling is doing, and that is called relative protein quantization. It is stable isotope labeling by amino acids in cell culture. And the first time paper published in 2002. Now, some more thing about the CLAC. Over the past decade, CLAC has become the preferable or preferred approach for protein wide quantization by mass spectrometry. This approach relies on the metabolic incorporation of isotopically enriched amino acids into the proteome of cells. The proteome of light, and these are the light one, H1, 12C, 14N, cells can then be compared with heavy one. So heavy one what? 1H to 2H, 12C to 13C, 14N to 15N, these are the heavy one. Cells as the isotopically labeled protein and peptide are easily distinguishable in a mass spectrometer. So even one addition in the H, one addition in the C, one addition in the N can be determined in the mass spectrometer. Since cellular uptake and response to isotopically different amino acids is never, it is without impact on the cell physiology. So basically these addition, 1H to 2H, 12C to 13C, and 14N to 15N, not affecting cell physiology. So this is the beauty of this experiment, or this kind of things. Now the third one is the isobaric tag for relative and absolute quantification. Last one was CLAC was only relative quantification. This isobaric is relative and absolute both quantification. So a novel MS-based approach for the relative quantification of protein, relying on the deviatization of primary amino groups, in intact proteins using isobaric tag for relative and absolute quantification is called eye track this is very recent and useful and many labs are doing so this i due to the isobaric mass design of the eye track agent differentially labeled protein do not differ in mass accordingly their corresponding proteolytic peptides appear as single peak in ms scale because oh sorry, quantitative information is provided by isotope encoded reporters ions that can only be observed in MSMS -MS spectra. We analyze the fragmentation behavior of ESI and MALDI ions of peptide generated from eye track labeled protein using top tops and Q top instruments. So again, all kind of the mass spectrometry the recent one those are top top and q top is using the eye track methodology where qualitative and quantitative both kind of determination protein determination can be done so if as proof of principle mixture of the five different proteins in various concentration ratio were quantified demonstrating the general applicability of the approach presented here to uh, MSB programmers. These are some of the uh, databases 
general protein sequence databases sequence severity search alignment tools structural analysis prediction servers i don't want to go detail this is this you can find out in the <coughs> internet but there are so many information already available you are not in the isolation you should use it and then um, this is just one thing i think we have already discussed in the last class so we don't have to go or wait i can just give you this example so basically if you see exogenous and endogenous signal it can go in the both ways epigenetic effect or you can see that that proteome and you can see either the genetic effect. So one side, one arm is genetic, another arm is epigenetic. So in the genetic effect, you can uh, use through genome and then transcriptome and then proteome. And epigenetic effect, right side, is coming through the proteome. You don't have to go genome and transcriptome. So epigenetic and proteome, and then genetic, genome and transcriptome, and again proteome. Ultimately, proteome is the last portion, and then isolate and solubilize cells fraction whole cells or tissue large scale highly parallel two dimensional electrophoresis like two electrophoresis or then you can do quantitative and qualitative image analysis protein id by MALD, ms or lcms ms or post translation modification ptms you can check through the lcms ms you can also do the biomolecular laser mechanism through a biomarkers molecular bio uh, descriptions for a structural activity like through NMR or many others. So all these are numerical and bio molecular databases. So here that we can do it. This is just one of the representation like you started with here, manual robotic export exchanges. So basically in the two data forces, you are having these kind of what uh, spots, either they are upgraded or they are downgraded. So you can you can take it out. Uh, either manually either the robotic and then you can do the some processes for the multi uh, mass spectrometry like reduction alkylation in situ triptych digestion and then you can go for the marley or tandem ms uh, that uh, uh, peptide separation via hplc or micro purification of peptides via reverse phase media now this machine instrument will give you this kind of peak that you can check out the database search and put identification you can find out which proteins are these. These spots are dependent to which kind of proteins that you can figure it out from here. In the more detail, uh, you can again go to the EST database search and protein ID uh, through here. So in uh, another way, again, we can tell any biological samples. You can go chromatography. And then you can go to the page or uh, mud bit, ion exchange, reverse phase. Now you can use the robotic uh, workstation. Now you can quantify these things either by ICAT, uh, orbit wrap, top MS, protein microarray, and then I, ICAT can be go by eye track, and then these three top MS go by ESI, MALD, or CELD. These ones again go for the differential protein pattern, quantitation of the protein, post translation mod modification, and protein identification. All things can be done. Further, you have to go for the validation and interpretation and the development of routine functional assay and clinical tests. If the slides are visible, protein sample preparation. Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So what we have gone through in the last slide, again repeating it, that any samples, like sample preparation, it need what? Fractionation of samples and protein extraction. That can be done by the digestion. After digestion, one can do LCMS, like liquid chromatography. And after liquid chromatography, one can go mass spectrometry. That depends on. You are going multi dof MS, or IN trap, or Pluto. So what kind of sample you have, what kind of ability you have, you can do. So this way you can do it. Uh, all this. Or another way, you can do two dimensional electrophoresis to be. Then you can take gel from that particular overexpress or underexpress protein, either by the manual or either by the robotic. 
and again you can go for the mass spectrometry all kind or you can do the 2d electrophoresis and then you can transfer that to the pvdf membrane go for the amino acid analysis and terminal sequencing directly you don't have to go msms all these ways you what you are going to do protein identification and detection of the protein changes that can be construct the databases or computer aided gel analysis or modifications like all kind of post translation modification you can see and then you can see the data any question concern from this part hello till now any question concern Are you guys able to see these stuffs or no? Yes, yes sir, able to see. Okay. So one more example, like kind of case study, I am giving it here. So like if we have brain tissue, so what we have to do? First, homogenize it. Like make the powder form or very small, small pieces so that cells can broken, cells can be seen. And then whatever the procedure, we have to do the centrifugation. And then you will have two things after centrifugation. One is pellet, that is nuclei or undissolved material. And second is superintendent. That superintendent contains cytosolic proteins and organelles. Now again you do centrifugation. That centrifugation again gives you pellet and superintendent. The pellet part, now mitochondria. And superintendent part, cytosolic protein and membranes. Now again you go for the centrifugation. You will find what now membranes, cell membranes are in the pellet, and superintendent has what only cytosolic protein. So see, during this process, from any kind of tissue, this is brain tissue, but you can have any other kind of tissue. You may uh, you can check it out, whole all cytosolic protein or organelles protein, or only mitochondrial protein, or only membrane protein, or only cytosolic protein. This can be differentiated then we all know if we add the mild agent mild agent means detergents then you can dissolve the nuclei pellet we can dissolve the mitochondrial pellet we can dissolve the membrane pellet and cytosolic protein we have to do the enrichment because the volume is too high till this this step and the protein possibly less so we have to do the enrichment to the chromatography or preparatory vector photosis and further for the all these stuffs either the nuclei protein either the mitochondrial protein either the membrane protein as well as the cytosolic protein we can do directly what two dimensional electrophoresis here you can check broad range narrow range basic range ipd steps and all these so basically cells is not only one cells cells have many other compartment pr golgi uh, and then uh, mitochondria nuclei many other so by just evolving some protocols you can separate those proteins also very specifically those original protein also very specifically and you can do the uh, their role you can figure it out their role in the different different circumstances now another one if it can, it can be used in the uh, like drug discovery and developmental process yes it can be used in the diagnostics so basically a lot of biomarkers uh, and, and target identification and then uh, it can go for the target validation there again protein function and interaction can be known then lead identification here high throughput screening of the lead compound a structured based drug design so here now a structured based lead identification and optimization can be done then lead optimization and improvement of animate property animate property like where solubilization of the protein Mm, or drug or then their bioavailability all these things can be checked so their toxicity also can be checked so basically uh, variation in response and selectivity uh, toxicoproteomics all things can be done then we do go for where preclinical trials clinical trials post approval monitoring and therapeutics so from diagnosis to therapeutics all these steps are there and proteomics is one of the tool that is evolved and engaged in every places now some of the basic stuff in the proteomics like if we do the uh, commercial blue staining 
we can detect 8 to 10 nanogram in one spot. Dynamic range 20 fold, uh, it is densitometric methods, Compa uh, compatible with analysis by MS, multiple multi mass spectrometry. This is linear range. Uh, so this method which use trichloric TCA and alcohol in the staining solution result in the esterification of aspartic and glutamic acid chain carboxyl group, complicating the interpretation of the mass spectrum. So it is not very ideal for the MS, but it can be. Now the second kind of the visualization method for protein is silver, silver staining. Here you can detect even 2 to 10 nanogram of the protein. Dynamic range 8 to 10 fold, linear response restricted to low uh, low nanogram amount of protein. Again, it is densitometry. Some protocols compatible with analysis by mass spectrometry, staining times and reaction temperature are critical for reproducibility. So again, this is uh, skilled. People can do it. Uh, otherwise, it is difficult in the reproducibility of the result. Now, zinc in imidazole. Here, the limit is 5 to 10 nanogram. Linear responses, restrictions to high nanogram to microgram even level. Then compatible with analysis by MS. We all know Psi 3, Psi 5. Uh, here, 5 to 10 nanogram. 1000 fold linear response. Very good. Fluorescent. It is not density automatic, it is fluorescent based. Hey, two, three samples you can do it. Mix up. Compatible with analysis by MS allow for both intra-gel intra or inter-gel relative quantification of protein spots from samples. Now the cypro ruby, 1 to 8 nanogram, very sensitive, 1,004 linear response on wide range, fluorescent, uh, compatible with analysis by MS, rapid, extending time is not critical and can be varied from experiment to experiment without problem. So these are the basic techniques uh, by, by uh, we can visualize proteins and utilize for MS or not. What are the pros and cons? Let me see. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the methods, the advantage, disadvantages. So, here one can see 2D electrophoresis and mass spectrometry. What are the methods? Uh, separation of complex protein by 2D electrophoresis based, um, that is based on charge and size. Major protein identification by MS and detects about 2000 to 2500 spots per gel. So in one gel, we can identify 2500 proteins. Advantage? Ability to identify unknown proteins, yes. Detect protein modification like phosphorylation, methylation, many other kind of PTMs. Used for various biological samples, including tissue, blood, and other biological fluids. Now the disadvantages. Proteins expressed at low abundance may be missed. Because limitation is 2000 to 2500 spots, so those are not top 2000 proteins they are going to miss here only suited for diagnostic application because uh, for diagnostic you cannot have 2000 or 2500 you know uh, markers you can have very specific one two or five so it, it is no useful for that limited reproducibility and high rate of false identification again this is too much user specific skilled people needed so that's why it is very much very from person to person, lab to lab. Limited dynamic range, semi quantitative. It is not quantitative, it is semi quantitative. Sensitivity, detection sensitivity is in the nanogram range. So 50 nanogram per spot for commercial blue and 1 nanogram per spot for silver stair. So we can do by both ways using fluorescent 2D differential gel electrophoresis to dyes. Hello. Set, uh -huh. Ha, uh, Ham Chandra sir. Hi, hello. Hi, ah. sir. Jazar, ah. uh, uh, as you discussed, the detection sensitivity is in the nanogram uh, per spot. I mean, uh, 50 nanogram per spot for the commercial blue, right? Yes. Uh, per spot, I mean, uh, actually, I didn't uh, perform that uh, 
uh, this uh, protein purification and other thing but can you please explain um, i mean how uh, per spot in cannot understand that thing like uh, uh, per spot means whatever the dot mm -hmm. is able to see by eye okay that dot required if you are uh, uh, performing commercial blue at least 50 nanogram concentration if we are doing the uh, this uh, another one uh, is who's doing that yes, then, then it should be at least one nanogram concentration so okay if less than one nanogram we are not able to visualize it okay 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 yeah. okay got it sir got it yeah and uh, using fluorescent 2d differential gelato fluorescent 2d dye and uh, sensitivity even improved by tenfold uh, when they are doing side eye label. So this is one of the uh, technique that people are using even in the uh, labs. Then the second thing is liquid chromatography uh, mass spectrometry (LCMS). Again, these are the uh, stuff. Then the advantages, disadvantages, and the limits. So the advantage of the LC, like uh, liquid chromatography, to separate proteins in a sample with sequential uh, LC for improved separation efficiency. So uh, normally in the conventional way, we are not separating, uh, but here sequentially we can separate it and the new techniques are even, they are uh, giving uh, that opportunity a lot. So different, different, uh, we know that uh, hydrophobic, uh, hydrophilic, and then uh, many different kind of nature of the uh, proteins. So based on our input, uh, we can have a different, different gradient and very well, uh, manner we can uh, separate it. So in that way, uh, getting the result, it, it, is, it is more, uh, we can say, the vigilant. And then second thing, the another part, mass, uh, to systematically identify the major protein. So first part, LC is uh, separate proteins, uh, sequentially based on their uh, characteristics, and the mass part, MS part, is basically identify major proteins. So that's why it is LC-MS, not LC or MS, it is LC-MS. So then detects over 1,000 protein per run. So that is another uh, advantage. At least 1,000, I can say now it, the unit is increasing. So now the advantage is ability to identify unknown proteins also. Second is improved separation efficiency compared to 2D gel. Because in 2D gel, uh, only one step. Uh, all spot, just uh, all proteins have just one spot. But here, you can separate it so you can have like volatile different or many many other ways so in that way you have more uh, separation better way and then you can detect it also uh, and detect even uh, 1000 so that's why it is better than for the separation we can say uh, compared to d used for various biological samples including tissue blood and other biological fluids and i think if you can talk today uh, most of the labs are uh, either doing either the uh, collaborating or sending samples for LCMS because this is very uh, you can say user friendly kind of uh, it gives you an ample amount of uh, information and it is very cost efficient also only the uh, first time investment but after that uh, these things are not very costly and then uh, disadvantage protein expressed at low abundance may be missed again because limitation is what 100 only sorry 1000 only so if you see your uh, protein of interest or your maybe some uh, unique stuff is uh, having concentration less than 1000 numbers, like the top 1000, you don't have your interest of the uh, proteins or your interest of the actual stuff, then you are not going to get it. Second thing, unsuited for diagnostic application. Again, as you have another way, 1000 stuff and the, so for diagnostic, how many you will take the marker? It will be very confusing that. Because for diagnostic, it has to be unique, like maybe one or maybe two or uh, that's it. 1000, you cannot figure it out. Okay, what are the metrics, which is one up and down or something like that. And then it can be a little bit, uh, little bit trace amount of variation may screw up many things. And third thing is limited reproducibility and a high rate of false identification. Again, sample preparation to preparation, skilled people needed to sample preparation because in science is always told, garbage in garbage out if your sample preparation is not good not appropriate not identical you will you are not going to get uh, same kind of result or correct result then limited dynamic range and semi-quantitative again this is again semi-quantitative 
and detection sensitivity in the nanogram range, like 20 per cells also one can see. So basically, if we have experiment with only 20 cells also, you can see this. And then 1% false positive rate as well. Yeah, moving further, the protein arrays. So protein arrays, individual protein immobilization on a solid support. It could be glass or membrane. Individual proteins identified by labeled antibodies. So here we have to put the labeled antibodies and then we can identify the proteins. Here again, we can detect more than 1000 proteins per array. Now the good thing is that high sensitivity and specificity, yes. Good quantitation range, yes. High throughput density amenable for automation. It is possible because it can be like, you know, uh, robotic based. We have the spots, we have the antibody. It is giving the result, that's it. Economically and low sample consumption, yes. Lots of data from single experiments, yes. Software and hardware tools maybe share with DNA microarray. It kind of uh, RNA uh, protein microarray or DNA microarray, yes. Now the disadvantages. Limited protein availability from complex protein uh, production process. Why? Because we have to put the antibody. And for that, we need to have uh, make antibody. We have to identify antibody. Uh, many, many things. So basically, unknown proteins, you cannot do it. And you have to make antibody for that. So making antibody is a difficult task. Making very specific antibody is again another difficult task. And that antibody has to be very potent, very efficient, is another difficult task. So that is the uh, lacune here. Otherwise, this is one of the very beautiful uh, it is the limited access to a large number of affinity antibodies for anti detection because we know that uh, getting very unique kind of uh, antibodies again a different task. Otherwise, it can be cross reacted with other antibodies, other species, or many others. And then making all protein antibodies again is very difficult. So, the detection sensitivity in the nanogram polymer branch. <coughs> Yeah, the next step is reverse phase protein arrays. Multiple whole cell or tissue ligate immunobilization on individual spots on a solid support, similar to tissue uh, microarray format. Presence of specific proteins are detected by antibody. Yes. Detects like uh, approximately 100 proteins per RS. Then uh, good thing is that high sensitive detection of proteins, high throughput, large number of samples on one slide, minimal sample required, the reduced number of antibodies needed to detect protein. The bad part are detection sensitivity may be compromised from loss native protein confirmation when surface is spotted. So this is the problem because there are uh, arrays reverse phase, so some layer of protein has gone. Limited sensitivity to get low abundance protein because only 100 protein per array. So again, it is one of the limitation. Specificity may be compromised from non-specific antibody binding. So potentially for high background. So as this is high background, so again, very trace amount or low amount of protein may not be able to catch. The limited number of available signaling uh, protein specific antibody. Again, this is a lacuna that we don't have a many number of signaling protein antibodies, so we cannot use it. Other things are like detection sensitivity is in the pico range, range picogram range. So very much uh, sensitive, very, very much. Increased sensitivity, yes, you, uh, using laser capture, okay, micro dissection. Ligates can be analyzed with a few 10 cells only. So even only 10 cells, one can do it. But then for only limited proteins. Now the antibody arrays. Antibody arrays like captured antibody are spotted and a fridge on a solid surface. Proteins, the are antigens, are captured on the array surface and detected by a second antibody specific for a different epitope then capture antibody like sandwich format again here also detect approximately 100 proteins per hour. the good part is high specific from dual antibody detection highly sensitive high throughput and amiable for automation possible to detect protein modifications like phosphorylation methylation any other and then suitable for clinical application also 
the bad part is protein complexity and denaturation may affect antigen antibody interaction need for high affinity and specific antibodies for capture and detection limited dynamic range of two or three orders of magnitude detection sensitivity is in the low picogram parallel batch so these are the uh, stuff now bead based assay i think most of the ngs or many other new things are coming using bead based assay so what are their rest of them? So either capture antibody or proteins are coated on beads. Detection of proteins by labeled antibody, similar to the antibody array or ELISA, detects 50 to 100 proteins per run. Advantages, highly sensitive and specific, high throughput and amenable for automation, detects protein quant modifications like phosphorylation, methylation, all of them by modifi uh, modification of specific antibodies suitable for clinical application the disadvantages are protein complexity and denaturation affecting antigen antibody interaction need for high affinity and specific antibodies for capture and detection limited dynamic range two to three fold long sensitivity detection limit is sufficient to capture low evidence protein even in the preparation now what are the these are the examples of from the early uh, 90s. Now, a lot many things came out like cellulose, acetate, citrate, agarose, electrophoresis in the hemoglobinopathemia, isoelectric focusing in the multiple sclerosis, cellular electrophoresis in the metabolic diseases, ulcerative colitis, chronic diseases, escapes, uh, tabulometry for lipase activity, C reactive protein, inflammation. So, many kinds of protein assays, arrays, R has been used for disease diagnosis from long time. Like uh, immuno affinity methods for HIV, Ebola, polio, malaria, autoimmune disorders, 2D dyes in the Jacob disease, mallet of MS in the urine uh, issues, then rapid antifacial various pathogenic bacterial, fungal, all of them. LMD, MS, renal amyloidosis, glomerulite nephritis, LCM, SMS, Endocrine disorders, vitamin D analysis, eye track, diagnosis of uh, this uh, GVHDs, clinical trials, ESI, MSMS, inborn errors of metabolism, newborn. This is one of the very in field uh, people are doing it. So many kind of things are even those we don't know. This is also going to come, and they are just taking the uh, the high support uh, proteomics and they are diagnosing it. Some applications like iCat. Relative quantification for protein estimation, uh, sensitive and de detect peptide at very low concentration. Uh, limitation is could not identify protein without lysine. This is the problem. For SILAC, detection of uh, differential expression of proteins. Advantage is high degree of labeling and straightforward estimation. Limitation is could not be done for tissue, limited to cell culture only. I track. Relative quantification using isobaric labeling. Advantage is high throughput sample can be multiplexed. Limitation is increased sample complexity. Mud pit applications are like identification of protein protein interaction. Advantage is large protein complex identification. Limitation no quantitative, high throughput is not possible. Protein arrays, quantization of a specific protein, usually diverse bio, disease biomarkers. Advantage a smaller sample volume required for highly sensitive assays. Limitation is like for protein and antibody making availability and their cost. Reverse phase protein arrays, application like robust quantification and estimation of proteins. Advantage is less expensive and simple to perform. Limitation is this is still evolving and not established yet. Somomers technology, application of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, pulmonary diseases. Advantage is multiplex and high throughput. Limitations is relatively higher cost. So basically, these are the stuffs for the protein from my side. Any questions, concern? Excuse me, sir. Uh, it is not directly potentially related with RNA, but do you have any idea regarding a specific protocol for isolation of mitochondrial DNA? 
Yeah, so for mitochondrial DNA, <clears throat> usually high speed uh, ultra centrifuge is required. As uh, we are, uh, we just uh, mentioned there no, that first uh, you will get uh, the separation from debris and the cytoplasm. So that debris is basically the nuclear stimulus. And then the next step, when you do again this process, you will get the mitochondria stuff. Mm. And again, if you want to do, you will get the cell membrane also. So these protocols are uh, widely available, but 